nows. I don't know if that has anything to do with what we're talking about today, but maybe it will. We'll come back to that perhaps. Welcome to another interactive notebook ta- challenge. This one is about designing your layout inspired by a content-inspired archetype. <sighs> that sounds complicated, so let's get right to it. Minimize my picture here. Uh, welcome. What we are going to be doing uh, with this particular challenge is very first thing you'll need to familiarize your students with the different types of archetypes. Archetypes. Everyone say that together. Archetypes. Uh, there are several categories. I have a two page document that will be attached to this lesson so that you can have that two page document for your students to know them all if they choose to. So, you need to be familiar with them. You need to have them read and learn some new content for class. You need to then have them choose an archetype or two. That's how I challenge my gifted students. Challenge them to inspire. Uh, the archetype has to somehow inspire the way that they present the content on their interactive notebook page. Basically, the archetype serves as the concept of the page or the theme of the page. And then finally, uh, I just want you to know that this technique works particularly well with... Uh, research or nonfiction that is story-based, um, that has a history to it. Uh, a lot of the archetypes are story-based, and you'll see that they work nicely if there's an actual story being told, not just a list of facts. So uh, be aware of that, um, but it can work with any um, content, really, and I'm trying to prove that with the teacher model I'm going to show you today. First of all, let's talk about what an archetype is is. Um, there's always that talk I have with my students about how much of our brain we actually use. Scientists, I think, are pretty confident that we use 100% of our brain, but there's always that level of consciousness versus unconsciousness. Uh, that's always an interesting debate. I walk through the world, I'll bet you do too, and you see people who are completely unconscious of the things they are doing that they probably should be conscious of. I know consciousness exists, uh, unconsciousness exists, and I've seen it, but uh, to what level does it exist? That's what Carl Jung, now here's the deal, uh, watch all the Jung YouTube videos you want, if you want really the down and dirty um, versions of Jung, uh, you're going to get them from me, I'm going to give you about the one minute version here, um, what Carl Jung uh, explored was the idea that if you if you look at all the ancient stories from myth from religion, from just ancient story collections um, of all the ancient cultures from all corners of the globe, you're going to find commonalities. And those commonalities take the form of symbols or types of people or the way that the stories get told. And those are called archetypes. And uh, there are different types, but uh, we're going to talk about the collective unconscious archetypes, which are the ones that all cultures seem to look at the same thing, for example, a big slimy green snake, and get the concept of evil out of that story. So uh, that's the concept of what a collective unconscious archetype is. And so here are some examples. These just come from my two-page document. These are character archetypes in all stories, be they true or not. You often find these types of characters. And I'm not going to read these to you. I'm just going to let you look at the titles and, and, and pause if you wish to, but know that these are on the two-page handout. These can be archetypes that inspire, perhaps, um, a content page inspired by someone's history. You'll find these apply to actual nonfiction history as well as fictional history. Um, in stories as well, um, fiction and nonfiction, but uh, in stories as well, things stand for things beyond themselves, like uh, elements of geography, um, elements of of, of object, like a a fountain in a story stands for something beyond itself. If you come across the dark cave and um, the evil is inside, the darkness and the cave are both archetypes of some bigger concept. They're just not caves. They stand for something beyond themselves. Uh, These are archetypal archetypal uh, plot lines. Um, You'll see these if you watch um, any of the uh, superhero movies, any of the Star Trek movies. These are the sorts of common plot lines, not just in our culture stories, but in cultures all over. And that's what makes them archetypal, is that they're uh, they're worldly, they're worldly symbol and symbolic ideas. And so um, we even got to a point where we have fine lists that colors can be archetypes and that numbers can be archetypes. Now, 
the trick here is you have to teach your students that every time you see the color green in a painting, they're not trying to show growth, sensation, hope, or fertility um, in a positive uh, context. That's not what green always means. It's a choice, and in truth, archetypal choices are probably not made as uh, often as, and perhaps they're even made unconsciously, but uh, you don't just assume that the number three always stands for the trinity when you see the number three. Um, and you do have to have that talk with students. But I'm going to take you through my process. So I'm starting this um, explanation by showing you what my um, layout looked like before I actually put my words down. Um, I studied a topic. I'm going to tell you what it is here in just a second. It's not the same topic you studied. Um, but I chose the color green as an archetype, which stands for fertility, which is important to the content I uh, looked up. And then I chose the concept of good and evil. And I decided I would build a page where I present this information that I researched um, where those two elements, green and good and evil, come into play. And so you can see how I kind of set that up with my serpent and my apple hanging next to my serpent. And I have a green halo in the corner and it's Corbett Green Jeans, which shows how old I am because I'm referring to Captain Kangaroo there. Look it up. It existed if you don't believe that it did. And uh, anyway, um, here's the story of why I looked this up. I have a peach tree that everyone in my neighborhood loves. It produces millions of peaches peaches for me and uh, those peaches are now growing way high up and I know that's a sign that I'm not pruning my tree properly and so um, as I get older 50 is coming up quickly for me um, I don't want to be falling off ladders picking peaches and so I'm going to prune my tree properly so that the peaches don't the highest I have to climb on my ladder is a couple of rungs that's the personal reason I looked up this content uh, in addition, I have a pear tree that grows pears that aren't very good, and then you get a lot of dead growth on the leaves, and I know I'm doing something wrong, and so I wanted to investigate what I was doing wrong with feeding and fertilizing my pear tree. And then I also have an apple tree that's uh, just about at the age that it should be producing fruit next year, and I want to make sure I'm doing everything right by my apple tree. And so that's the content that I studied, um, and here are the notes that I took. I read about five or six articles that I found. Um, I looked some specific on the specific types of trees and got some very specific information, but I ended up with two pages of notes that I thought would be personally useful to me in the future as I take on this personal quest. And I said, uh, I didn't choose quest as my archetype. I chose good versus evil and green. And here's why. Um, fertility is what I want from my apple tree and my pear tree. So the green's was an important concept but then the good versus evil the evil idea of me falling off of a ladder being one but I think there might be some sickness or some bugs going on with my pear tree too and so I'm gonna fight that evil and so you kind of see that visually represented with my snake and the little flies buzzing around it over there and this is the page that I uh, came up with and uh, I want you to know that wasn't my first draft. There's my first draft. And I'm actually really glad I made this first draft because I realized on the left-hand side of the page, I didn't have nearly enough information unless I spread it out for the final. And so having that practice page was important for me to be able to build this page. And then that having that much white space allowed me to fill in, to be able to f include the information that's there on the left-hand side. Um, if you look back at that, you'll see there's plenty of on the right-hand side for information about the the pear and the apple trees that I found but on the left hand side I wasn't going to have room and so I'm glad I practiced my layout that is the lesson I just am trying to uh, uh, teach here and so this is what the layout became and look here's what the final draft became um, because there was enough information I decided that I would type that information um, I put the information about the specific trees on the right on address labels I use address labels often in my notebooks they're fun because they're sticky. Um, you can make sorts with them. You can actually unpeel them and sort them without ripping pages, but you can scramble them up and have them draw lines or connect yarn um, from one sticker to the category it's supposed to fit under. Here, I just fancily uh, arranged them. What I did with uh, good, first of all, I used green a lot um, in my coloring. Um, it's also pointed out in my uh, words. I spoke specifically with words like greenhorn in my write-ups. And then good versus evil. Um, you'll notice I highlighted good versus evil. My cartridge is running out. Sometimes the colors aren't pull pulling as they're supposed to, but the goods are supposed to be an innocent blue and the evil is supposed to be an evil red. Um, but I 
used the words throughout my descriptions, and that helped me write the descriptions in my own words, not plagiarize the descriptions as I found them in the research, which is an important thing to make sure your students are doing. And then finally, the interactive element, I made it easy this time. I've seen some of my students' examples recently, and they're making them pretty complicated. Here's an easy one, all right, watch this. Find five other places in my write-up where I could have used the word good or evil. That's the discussion. So we look over the information together as I am sharing it my interactive page with you. And there's your task at the end of it. Very simple. Um, they don't have to be as complicated as um, some of the puzzles that some of you are creating as your interactive elements. And so here's what I basically just took. You familiarize um, your students with the different types of archetypes. I have a two-page handout, easy for me to do, but that's the very first step of this lesson. Then when you have them read some new information, um, have them process it in a way where they're thinking about those archetypes. Because what you're going to ultimately have them do is look at that list. I have a two-page list of archetypes, one or two, that they might actually use to build a concept, to build a theme on which they can present and place the information that you uh, have asked them to learn about. Um, it can be assigned information or, as you saw in my case, information that I was just personally interested in. Um, and as I said, it works particularly well if you're telling a story from history. If there's a person involved, then you can use those archetypical plot devices, those archetypical characters um, as well. So uh, be interesting in the way that you do that. Hey, um, in 2018 at Always Write, our website, we're in the process of just building some of these video examples of some challenges you can your interactive notebooks if you're running a program like that or a routine like that with your students. Um, we find it to be a valuable routine, so we're just sharing our ideas. Um, we hope that perhaps you'll join us and, uh, and maybe even share some of your ideas back with us. Um, the interactive notebooks uh, are a way for our students to uh, interact with each other and celebrate the learning that they're you know, doing while being innovative. And then the best part, they sit and they share them with each other conversations they have during those shares, um, they learn more from each other than any lecture I've ever given a student. And that to me is uh, what makes it worth the time. So uh, you have a great day everyone and uh, keep on writing. Thanks.